Level 1, IPsec VPN module. In this module, we will discuss the following topics. Basic concepts of VPN, IPsec VPN to include authentication, MD5 and SHA, encryption, DES, triple DES, and RSA, AES, Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, security protocols, AH and ESP, authentication and IPsec modes, security associations, or SAs, and configuration examples. And finally, VPN HA, or VPN High Availability. Basic Concepts of VPN What is VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. In the past, when transmitting data in a secure way, networks would need to have a costly site-to-site -site leased line between the sites. A VPN gives users a secure way to access corporate network resources over the internet or other public or private networks without the expense of leased site-to-site -site lines. A secure VPN is a combination of tunneling, encryption, authentication, access control, and auditing technologies and services used to transport traffic over the internet or any insecure network that uses the TCP IP protocol suite for communication. There are many reasons for using a VPN. First is security, which includes the following. Authentication. With authentication, a VPN receiver can verify the source of the packets and guarantee the data integrity. Encryption. With encryption, a VPN guarantees the confidentiality of the original user data. Integrity. Because the packets are numbered sequentially with IPsec and encrypted, and authenticated, packet tampering is improbable and replay detection prevents malicious attacks. The second reason is cost, which includes reducing the number of access lines. Many companies pay monthly charges for two types of access lines, either high-speed links for their primary internet access or frame relay, ISDN primary rate interface, or T1 lines to carry data. A VPN may allow a company to carry data traffic over its internet access line, thus reducing the need for some installed lines. It also cuts long-distance phone charges. Long-distance phone charges are reduced with a VPN because a user typically dials a local call to an ISP rather than placing long-distance calls directly to the home office or remote site when dialing into the company's VPN. Benefits of a VPN tunnel. A VPN tunnel has the following benefits. We know that IP-based networks have a weakness related to the structure of IP itself. IP's original architects had no reason to provide any security features at the IP level, and IP's flexibility allows for some creative use of the protocol that defeats traffic auditing, access control, and many other security measures. IP-based network data is, therefore, wide open to tampering and eavesdropping. So, with tunneling, Protocol packets of one type of network are put inside or encapsulated in the protocol packets of another network for transport across that network. This ensures security of the data transmission. IPsec VPN Internet Protocol Security, or IPsec, is a standards-based VPN that offers flexible solutions for secure data communications across a public network. In the traditional network layer, IP packets have no inherent security. It is relatively easy to forge the address of IP packets, modify the contents of IP packets, replay old packets, and inspect the contents of IP packets in transit. Therefore, there are no guarantees in IP datagram transmission. IPsec is a method of protecting the IP datagram. It is built around a number of standardized cryptographic techniques to provide confidentiality, data integrity, and authentication at the IP layer. IP does not inherently provide any protection to your transferred data. It does not even guarantee that the sender is verified. IPsec tries to remedy this. These services are considered distinct, but IPsec supports them in a uniform manner. Benefits include confidentiality, the IPsec sender can encrypt packets before transmitting them across the network. Integrity. The IPsec receiver can validate packets sent by the IPsec sender to ensure that the data has not been altered during transmission. Authentication. 
The IPsec receiver can verify the source of IPsec packets and guarantee the data integrity replay detection. We use replay detection to ensure a transaction can only be carried out once unless we are authorized to repeat it. An example, it should not be possible for someone to record a transaction and then replay it verbatim in order to get an effect of multiple transactions being received by the peer. Consider also that the attacker must know the purpose of the traffic by means other than cracking the encryption, and that the traffic will cause events favorable for him. Again, a VPN provides secure communication between sites without the expense of leased site-to-site -site lines. A secure VPN is a combination of tunneling, encryption, authentication, access control, and auditing. It is used to transport traffic over the internet or any insecure network that uses TCP IP for communication. Before data is protected by an IPsec VPN, IKE Phase 1 and Phase 2 negotiation must first be invoked. After the Phase 1 negotiation, secure parameters including encryption and authentication algorithms and keys are generated. These parameters are used to protect data, which we call a secure tunnel. Phase 2 negotiation is then under the protection of this tunnel. After Phase 2 negotiations, another set of secure parameters are generated. These parameters are also used to construct another secure tunnel. A VPN finally uses this second tunnel for data transmission. Data is encrypted or authenticated according to the secure parameters negotiated in Phase 2. UDP with protocol number 17 and port 500 are used for IKE Phase 1 and Phase 2 negotiations. As to data transmission, ESP protocol 50 or AH protocol 51 are used. Note that these are protocols like TCP or UDP, not TCP or UDP ports. Authentication relies heavily on a hash function. For the MD5 hash function, the input can be any length and any type, but the output will always be a fixed length text file. The output of MD5 is 128 bits, or 16 bytes digest. For the authentication hash, you can use either MD5 or SHA. The difference between MD5 and SHA1 are thus. For MD5, the input has no limitation of length. The output of MD5, as stated earlier, is a 128 bits or 16 bytes digest, and MD5 is faster at hashing than SHA1. SHA1 might be slower to hash, but the output of SHA1 is a 160 bits or 20 bytes digest. Because it supports a larger digest, it's stronger against brute force attacks, making SHA1 more secure. Similarly, SHA-256 and SHA-512 are harder to compute, but are even stronger against brute force attacks due to their increasing output bits. Obviously, SHA-512 is going to be the strongest, but also has the most CPU-intensive usage. As depicted on this figure, encryption and decryption is a cyclic procedure. At first, the plain text is input to the encryption algorithm, and the cipher text is generated as output. Then, the cipher text is input into the decryption algorithm, and the input is generated as output. There are two types of encryption algorithms, symmetric and asymmetric. If the encryption key and decryption key are the same, we call this a symmetric encryption algorithm, such as Data Encryption Standard, or DES. If the encryption key and decryption key are different, it is an asymmetric encryption algorithm, such as the Rivest, Shamir, Adelman standard, or RSA. This diagram shows the symmetric cryptography workflow using the same secret key to encrypt plain text and decrypt cipher text. This diagram shows the asymmetric cryptography workflow using different security keys to encrypt plain text and decrypt the cipher text. Duffy Hellman Key Exchange is used to create something called a shared secret. A shared secret is made when two networking devices create a key from pre shared keys or certificates and then share part of it with the peer. The first task is for each network device to create a key pair. One mathematical expression is generated from it. 
two keys are formed, a private key and a public key. Each network device will send its public key to its peer. The private key is never shared with any other device, but it is linked mathematically to the public key. In this way, in combination with a pre-shared key or certificate, each peer is able to complete the decryption key so that one peer can decrypt traffic from the other, and vice versa. The Zywall USG supports Diffie-Hellman key groups for encryption keys. DH1 uses a 768-bit random number. DH2 uses a 1024-bit random number. DH5 uses a 1536-bit random number. The longer the key, the more secure the encryption, but also the longer it takes to encrypt and decrypt information. There are two security protocols in IPsec, ESP, the Encapsulation Security Payload, and AH, or Authentication Header. An ESP packet is identified by the protocol field 50 of an IP header, and AH packet is protocol 51. The above three figures show the original IP packets and IP packets after ESP and AH respectively. For ESP and AH packets, an ESP AH header is inserted between the IP header and the upper data layer. ESP can provide both encryption and authentication, and it's possible to do ESP without either. However, it's invalid to have ESP without encryption and authentication because it provides no security. When applying encryption, the ESP header is not encrypted, but the upper data layer and a portion of the ESP trailer are. Although AH can only provide authentication, it doesn't only authenticate the AH header and the upper data layer, but also the IP header. The AH header includes a next header, payload length, SPI, sequence number, and authentication data. The next header field indicates the type of data that is contained in the protected data field, namely IP and IP or TCP. The payload length field indicates the length of the header itself in a 32-bit word, minus 2. The reserved field is not used and must be set to 0. SPI, along with the destination IP address and security protocol, is used to identify the security associations. The sequence number is an incrementally increasing counter that is identical to that used in ESP. The authentication data field is used to hold the result of the data integrity check. Because AH authenticates the whole IP header, the IP header can't be altered during transmission. In other words, AH is not a NAT-friendly protocol. The ESP header includes SPI and sequence number. SPI, or the security parameter index, along with the destination IP address and security protocol, is used to identify the SA. It is authenticated but not encrypted because it's used to identify the state encryption algorithm and key used to decrypt the packet. If the SPI was encrypted, we'd have a serious chicken and egg problem. Sequence number provides anti-replay service to ESP. This value is a unique and incrementally increasing number inserted to the header by the sender. The sequence number is also authenticated but not encrypted. This is because we want to determine whether a packet is a duplicate before expending resources to decrypt it. IV, or initial vector, is required when applying some encryption algorithm, such as DES, in CBC mode. Note that the IV is not encrypted along with the protected data. Padding is used to maintain boundaries. Certain modes of encryption algorithm require the input to the cipher to be a multiple of its block size. Padding accomplishes this. The authentication data field is used to hold the result of the data integrity check. ESP provides confidentiality by encryption algorithms such as DES and triple DES, and data integrity and data source authentication through authentication algorithm like MD5 or SHA. The sequence number helps to protect against replay attacks. To provide data integrity and data source authentication, an authentication procedure must be conducted. 
several steps are involved. One, we generate a MAC or message authentication code. The message and shared keys are input into a function called the HMAC. Two, the sender then sends the message attached with the MAC to the receiver. Three, the receiver generates a new MAC prime with the received message and shared keys as the sender did. Four, if the MAC and MAC prime are equal, the message is authenticated. The IPsec protocol, AH and ESP, can be used to protect either the entire IP payload or the upper layer protocols of an IP payload. This distinction is handled by considering two different modes of IPsec, transport mode and tunnel mode. Transport mode is mainly for an IPsec host to protect data generated locally, while tunnel mode is for security gateways to provide IPsec services for other machines lacking of IPsec capability. However, there is no restriction that the IPsec hosts and the security gateway must be separate machines. Both IPsec protocols, AH and ESP, can operate in either transport mode and tunnel mode. As mentioned before, AH, like ESP, has transport mode and tunnel mode. Transport mode is used to protect the upper layer protocols. Tunnel mode is used to protect the entire IP datagram and a new IP header is added to that. Transport mode can only be used to protect packets where the communication endpoint is also the cryptographic endpoint. The AH data format in tunnel mode is illustrated here. The entire protected IP packet is encapsulated and the AH header and new IP header is added to that. The outer IP datagram contains the address of the IPsec endpoints. The inner IP datagram contains the original addressing of the communication. Tunnel mode can be used to protect packets where the communication endpoint is not the same with the cryptographic endpoint. The ESP data format in transport mode is illustrated here. Transport mode can only be used to protect packets where the communication endpoint is also the cryptographic endpoint. The ESP data format in tunnel mode is illustrated here. The entire protected IP packet is encapsulated in the ESP header and a new header is added to that. The outer IP datagram contains the address of the IPsec endpoints. The inner IP datagram contains the original addressing of the communication. Tunnel mode can be used to protect packets where the communication endpoint is not the same with the cryptographic endpoint. Security associations, or SAs, form the basics of IPsec. The SA is the contract between the two communication entities. It specifies how to protect data, such as what encryption algorithm, authentication algorithm, keys, and so forth are being used for securing the packets. IKE, or Internet Key Exchange, is based on a framework defined by the Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocols, ISA KMP. Two separate phases are involved in IKE. In phase one, peers negotiate an IKE SA to establish an authenticated and secured channel between themselves. In phase two, IPsec SAs are established for the subsequent data transmission. Since the IKE SA is already authenticated, it can be used to provide source authentication, integrity, and confidentiality to all messages in Phase 2. There are three modes for IKE Phase 1 and Phase 2 negotiation. Main mode or aggressive mode can be chosen for Phase 1 negotiation. Quick mode is always applied to Phase 2. IKE negotiation packets, no matter main mode, regressive mode, or quick mode, are transmitted via UDP 500. Data transmission between IPsec endpoints via ESP or AH protocols can only be done after IPsec SAs have been successfully negotiated. In the first step of Phase 1, IKE negotiates the security parameters such as encryption algorithm, hash algorithm, Diffie-Hellman group, authentication method, and so forth according to the policy pre-configured in each side. Secondly, Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange takes place to generate the shared secret. 
Upon completion of the Diffie Hellman exchange, the two peers have a shared secret which may be used to protect their communication, but the secret is not authenticated. Therefore, the final step is to authenticate the secret. The pre-shared key can be used to authenticate the secret. IKE essay negotiation using main mode consists of three two-way exchanges between the essay initiator and the responder. In the first exchange, both sides agree on basic security parameters, such as encryption and authentication algorithms. In the second exchange, both sides exchange public keys for a Diffie-Hellman exchange and pass each other a nonce, which is a random number for partners to sign and thus verify its identity. In the third exchange, both sides authenticate their identities to each other, namely, to authenticate the secret exchange in the second exchange. The parties actually use the generated shared Diffie-Hellman values in three permutations to generate derivation key, authentication key, and encryption key. The derivation key is used for generating additional keys in phase two. The authentication key and encryption key are to be used for the IKE SA. In aggressive mode, as much information as possible is passed in the first packets, such as SA, Diffie-Hellman public value, a nonce for the other party to sign, and an ID that the responder can use to check the initiator's identity with the third party. The responder then sends back everything needed to complete the exchange, including an optional certification payload and digital signature. Finally, the initiator confirms the exchange and also sends its certification and signature to the responder to verify its identity. Compared to main mode, which requires six packets total between peers, aggressive mode is faster than main mode because the initiator sends everything in the first transaction and only three packets total. However, the security level is less than that of main mode. This is because the transaction packets are not encrypted in aggressive mode. In phase two, two peers negotiate general purpose IPsec essays under the protection of the IKE essay negotiated in phase one. The parameter of the IPsec essay includes the following. Security protocol, that is the protocol used to carry data. Encryption, the encryption function, typically DES, triple DES, or AES. Authentication, which is the authentication function, such as SHA or MD5, Diffie-Hellman group. If PFS or perfect forward secrecy is not applied, the keys used for IPsec essays are derived from the Diffie-Hellman secret exchanged in phase one. If PFS is applied, an additional Diffie-Hellman exchange is performed to generate keys for IPsec essays. Finally, there's the mode, either transport mode or tunnel mode. Peers also need to establish a policy wherein local and remote networks are to be protected by the VPN tunnel. Quick mode is a three packet exchange like aggressive mode. Since the identities of both initiator and responder have been verified in previous phase one, it is needless to follow the three pair step as in main mode. If PFS is not applied, new keys are derived from the Diffie-Hellman secret exchange in phase one. If it is applied, an additional Diffie-Hellman exchange is performed to generate keys for IPsec essays. The responder then sends back everything needed to complete the exchange, including an optional certification payload and digital signature. Finally, the initiator confirms the exchange and also sends its certification and signature to the responder to verify its identity. An IPsec VPN tunnel is usually established into two phases. Each phase establishes a security association, as previously discussed. The first phase establishes an IKE SA between the Zywall USG and the remote IPsec router. The second phase uses the IKE SA to securely establish an IPsec SA through which the Zywall USG and remote IPsec router can send data between computers on the local and remote networks. Gateway types include the following. Site to site, which is a remote IPsec router that uses a static IP address. Site to site with dynamic peer, which is a remote IPsec router that uses a dynamic IP address and remote access, which is 
the remote peer is an IPsec VPN client such as a computer or smartphone with an IPsec software client. To configure an IPsec VPN connection, you must follow the steps shown. First, use the VPN gateway to specify the IPsec routers at either end of a VPN tunnel and the IKE SA settings. You can also activate and deactivate each VPN gateway. Next, use the VPN connection to specify which VPN gateway a VPN connection policy uses and which devices can use the VPN tunnel and IPsec SA settings. You can also activate and deactivate and connect or disconnect each VPN connection. Then, after the VPN gateway and VPN connection are configured, a direct route will be automatically created by the Zywall USG to route traffic based on the Phase 2 settings. If you need to further customize which networks can route through the VPN tunnel, you will also need to configure the policy route to specify which source addresses can be used in the IPsec VPN. Scenario 1 shows the most common IPsec VPN application, using IPsec VPN to connect two different sites. If both of them have a static IP address, it's called a site-to-site -site IPsec VPN. In the figure above, you can see the configuration information on both Phase 1 and Phase 2. When configuring your IPsec parameters, you must consider proper parameters for My Address, Peer Address, and Pre-Shared Key in Phase 1, and Local Policy and Remote Policy in Phase 2. These will be relative to the Zywall USG you're configuring. For example, the My Address for one peer will alternately be the peer gateway for the other peer. To begin configuring an IPsec tunnel, go to the Configuration, VPN, IPsec VPN menu and click on the Gateway tab to make your way to the Gateway or Phase 1 policy. Add or edit a new policy to see the menu shown here. Use the drop-down menu to specify the interface that will be used to connect to the remote site and then enter the IP address of the remote site in the static address field. Make a note of the interface's IP address so you can use it on the other Zywall USG VPN peer. The pre-shared key will be used to authenticate the data integrity. Therefore, you must enter the same pre-shared key on both devices. In the Configuration, VPN, IPsec VPN menu, on the Connection tab, you can add or edit your connection or Phase 2 policy to see the menu shown here. You can choose the different VPN gateway types in this configuration page. We will discuss these three gateway types in detail in the next section. Here, we are configuring a site-to-site -site VPN. Therefore, we just need to enable the site-to-site -site checkbox and then select the correct VPN gateway configured in the previous step from the drop-down menu. In the policy section, you must choose which addresses are allowed to cross the VPN tunnel to the remote peer. You must also select to which remote addresses those local machines can communicate. You can choose an existing address range or create a new address object. The site-to-site -site with dynamic peer VPN is quite similar to the site-to-site -site VPN. The only difference between them is that the site-to-site -site with dynamic VPN doesn't contain the IP address of the remote site and the VPN tunnel can only be established by the dynamic peer. Please note that for the dynamic IP address VPN tunnel, after the tunnel is established, the system will automatically generate routes for the corresponding VPN traffic. Therefore, no policy route is needed for dynamic VPN. The next scenario is remote access. This is only for an IPsec VPN client, such as a computer with an IPsec software on it or a smartphone with an IPsec client on it. By default, the policy route will be created by the system when the SA is created. If you would like to do more management, you'll have to enable Use Policy Route to control IPsec VPN rules, which will be discussed later. If you enable this function, however, as discussed, the auto destination address also needs to be enabled. Again, we'll discuss this later. Policy routes are typically generated automatically after the device establishes a VPN connection. This is called a direct route. However, you can use policy route to control dynamic IPsec rules 
to allow the administrator to create corresponding policy routes manually, this feature provides more flexibility for management of IPsec VPN tunnels. When sending IPsec traffic across the VPN tunnel, MTU can cause problems. This is because IPsec adds additional overhead to the original packets. If the packet size is greater than the maximum MTU allowed on the interface where the crypto map is applied, and if the do not fragment bit is set, then the Zywall USG will drop the packets. Therefore, you can use the ignore don't fragment setting in the IPv4 header to tell the Zywall to ignore this bit and therefore not have it drop IPsec packets by fragmenting them instead. We will discuss this feature in detail more later in this presentation. In ZLD 4.10, the feature Use Policy Route to Control IPsec VPN Rule is disabled by default. The system will still create direct routes as previously discussed for VPNs automatically, but we can use policy routes to control IPsec traffic instead if we enable this feature. Why do we want to use policy routes to control the VPN rules for dynamic peers? In the example above, if you use the policy route created by the system, this means that all traffic will be sent when the destination is 192.168.2.0/24, but you cannot control the bandwidth or restrict the access rights of some servers on the remote site. <laughs> Using a policy route, the administrator can now define which PCs can or cannot be reached. If you would like to control the bandwidth for the remote IPsec VPN clients, you might enable the Use the Policy Route to Control IPsec VPN rules, but in the Policy Route configuration page, you must specify the destination address. So what should be entered in this field? You can't use any for the destination address because that would encapsulate all traffic from the Zywall USG into the IPsec tunnel but at the same time, you don't know what the exact IP address of the remote IPsec VPN client is either. The Auto Destination Address field is displayed only when you select a VPN tunnel in the Type field and the remote peer has a dynamic IP address. Enable this feature to have the Zywall USG use the IP address of the peer that initiated an incoming dynamic IPsec tunnel as the destination address of the policy route. Why fragment packets? Normally, after the additional overhead on the packets is imposed by IPsec, the packet length might be greater than the MTU allowed on the interface, and the Zywall USU will normally fragment these packets to send them out. If the packet length is greater than the MTU allowed on the interface and the don't fragment or DF bit is used, the Zywall USG will not fragment the packets but instead drop them directly, which obviously may cause problems in some applications. Instead, the Zywall USG can be configured to ignore the DF bit and force the Zywall USG to fragment these packets to get around this MTU issue with IPsec. You can toggle the Ignore Don't Fragment setting in the IPv4 header feature in the Configuration VPN IPsec VPN menu in the VPN Connection tab, meaning it's a global setting for all IPsec tunnels on the Zywall USG, which makes sense given that you'll be probably using the same outgoing interface for most of your VPN tunnels. Shown here is a packet capture with the DF bit disabled in the IPv4 header. You'll note that the bit is instead marked as not set, meaning that this packet can be fragmented by the Zywall USG, but only because the VPN client allows us to do this. If we enable the ignore don't fragment feature, the Zywall USG will fragment all sent packets that are larger than the MTU, even if the don't fragment bit on the IP header is set to be on. This means that even if the clients don't wish for packets to be fragmented, the Zywall USG may fragment them anyhow to prevent them from being dropped due to the WAN MTU limitation. Scenario 6, Hub and Spoke VPN, or VPN Concentrator. A VPN concentrator routes all VPN traffics across multiple remote sites without complex settings. This reduces configuration overhead and prevents the possibility of configuration errors. A VPN concentrator also provides centralized management since all traffic has to go through it before transmitting to the remote sites. 
Thus, the administrator can set up different access control rules based on the source address, remote address, user, and schedule to enhance VPN security. Network access records are stored in the centralized office for further analysis. To use this feature, go to the Configuration, VPN, IPsec VPN, Concentrator menu. VPN Concentrator configuration is done by adding already configured VPN connection members. The VPN Concentrator will automatically route VPN traffic among the members. Therefore, you don't have to manually configure the policy routes to route remote branch traffic to VPN tunnels, making the setup extremely easy. On the VPN Connection Configuration page, you can also configure inbound, outbound traffic NAT. We'll discuss this now, in the next few slides. Outbound SNAT is aimed to hide the real local network on the remote VPN site. The application shown here is rare and suitable only for one-way traffic because the remote site can't find a way to send packets back until we set up an inbound DNAT rule to translate the DNAT to the real local network addresses. In this application, however, we have outbound SNAT at both ends. This application is meant to solve the local subnet overlapping problem without modifying the original network structure. For example, the original site subnet is 192.168.1.x, and another site has been merged into the VPN scope. This additional site also uses 192.168.1.x subnet, and the administrator doesn't want to modify the whole network deployment due to the extra configuration effort and possibly having to change addresses on servers and other static IP address equipment. Because IPsec relies upon routing from one subnet to another, each side of the VPN tunnel must be a different subnet for routing to correctly occur. In this case, we have to use outbound SNAT at both ends and inbound DNAT to overcome the overlapping internal subnet issue. In this scenario, inbound DNAT works as a Zywall USG virtual server. It can redirect the VPN traffic to the internal server. The user needs to pay special attention to the configuration on the firewall rule and policy routes on the Zywall USG with the server to make sure packets can reach the specific server. For example, VPN DMZ traffic may be blocked by default, requiring a security policy to allow this traffic to be forwarded. In this final scenario, the inbound SNAT will modify the SNAT to a fake address, and then the local user has no way to find the remote VPN local network segment. This application is meant to protect a remote subnet, but the VPN will become a one-way transmission. Such an example would be for a remote site sending logs and reports to a collector at the main office. VPN High Availability, or VPN HA. IPsec VPN failover is a mechanism for providing a backup VPN tunnel once the main tunnel is disconnected. From firmware 2.20 and above, IPsec VPN fallback is supported on the Zywall USG series. It also has a mechanism to renegotiate the main tunnel even when the backup VPN tunnel is still up. It is better for an enterprise to maintain 100% uptime without failure by providing a secondary VPN tunnel. In this manner, remote branch offices do not need to worry about an IPsec outage causing trouble in accessing internal resources from the headquarters. Additionally, VPN tunnel usage can reduce the total enterprise running costs in tangible and intangible ways. In this scenario, the Zywall USG branch has two WAN links, one to ISP1 and another to ISP2. To ensure high availability of the VPN tunnel between the HQ Zywall USG and the branch Zywall USG, we need to configure VPN failover in the branch Zywall USG. When the primary VPN tunnel goes down because ISP1 is down, the branch Zywall USG will negotiate another VPN tunnel with WAN2 to the HQ Zywall USG. Since users expect the main VPN tunnel to return after the primary VPN gateway becomes available again, the IPsec VPN fallback procedure is needed once again. After failover occurs, the fallback mechanism in the branch Zywall USG will try to negotiate with WAN1 of the branch Zywall USG to rebuild the tunnel. Once WAN1 becomes available, 
the main VPN tunnel will replace the backup tunnel. The gateway policy at HQ will look like a typical site to dynamic client example. Because HQ, in our example, has only one WAN interface, it's specified in the My Address section. Because the branch Zywall USG is using WAN DHCP, the peer gateway address is set to dynamic address. HQ's connection settings are also similar to our previous examples with the appropriate local and remote networks referenced in the corresponding policies. At the branch, we'll leave the domain name IPv4 field set to 0.0.0.0 to not specify either WAN interface. Because HQ in our example has only one gateway address, no other settings are required. However, if HQ did have a secondary redundant gateway, like an additional WAN connection, it could be specified in the secondary peer gateway address field. We'll talk more about this later in this section. Like HQ's connection settings, the appropriate local and remote networks are referenced in the corresponding policies on the branch Zywall USG. Since VPN is not aware which interface is active and which interface is passive, we have to enable the CLI on the branch site to keep the VPN always on the active interface when it's alive. You can do this by using the command shown here on the CLI through console, telnet, SSH, or the Java console interface on the web GUI. Here you can see examples of the VPN monitor when the tunnel is active, when the main connection is down and the secondary connection is up, and when the main connection comes back up to resume its VPN role. In this example, the HQ Zywall USG has two WAN connections for VPN high availability. This being the case, how do we go about configuring the branch office to use both of those interfaces? The gateway connection for HQ remains unchanged from our previous example with one important exception. The domain name IPv4 address for my address is left at IP address 0.0.0.0. This enables HQ to accept incoming VPN requests on any WAN interface. HQ's VPN connection settings are unchanged from the previous example. On the branch Zywall USG, we have two peer gateway addresses, a primary and secondary address. You'll also note that fallback to primary gateway when possible is checked. When this feature is enabled, if the connection to the primary address goes down and the Zywall USG changes to using the secondary connection, the Zywall USG will reconnect to the primary address when it becomes available again and stops using the secondary connection. Users will lose their VPN connection briefly when the Zywall USG changes to a backup gateway or reconnects to the primary gateway. Additionally, to use this feature, the peer device at the secondary gateway address cannot be set to use a nailed up VPN connection. The fallback check interval allows the administrator to set how often to check if the primary address is once again available. The branch Zywall USG's connection settings remain unchanged from our previous example. Here you can see examples of the VPN monitor when the main tunnel is active and when the main connection is down and failover occurs. In the system logs, you can see the Zywall USG try to reach the primary tunnel gateway at the appropriate check interval. When it does, you'll be able to check the VPN monitor and logs to see if the tunnel is able to successfully reconnect the primary gateway. The fallback mechanism starts only when IPsec VPN failover has occurred and the GUI option, fallback to primary peer gateway when possible, is enabled. Fallback mechanism stops when there is no active SA binding with the VPN gateway or IPsec VPN fallback has already occurred. Nailed up should be disabled on the secondary peer Zywall USG, otherwise, even if fallback succeeds, the secondary peer Zywall USG will initiate the tunnel all the time, causing severe IPsec problems and loss of VPN connectivity. End of module.